the way of Will John. People, welcome back. We have Dr. Giles Yo with us. And uh, we're going to get into a lot of stuff. So, Dr. Giles Yo, can I call you Giles? or Be called Giles, please. Don't make me sound old. <laughs> Perfect. All right. <laughs> How you doing? How are things? How's I, life? I, I am very well. Thanks for having me on. Can I call you Will? Okay, fair. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, you know, it is true. The people that call me William, they're from like my my school schooling days. So that will make me or feel your mother as well. William? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. William, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? But uh, okay. So uh, you're in an industry that, like we talked about just before we got on here, is mm. full of information, full of different, uh, let's say, mistakes, uh, misinformation, all this stuff. Give us a background into who you are and how you've become, let's say, an expert in this and why you're qualified to talk about everything we're about to get into today. So, uh, well, I'm, my name is Giles Yo. Um, I'm a uh, professor at the University of Cambridge where I study. So my day job is I study uh, how our brain controls food intake and the genetics of body weight. So they're both of the, the, both of the things. So that's what I do. That's what I teach. Um, I'm, I'm here. But in my spare time, <laughs> in very many ways, I do a little bit of... Um, uh, uh, popular science writing and some podcasts as we're doing now and broadcasting in which I actually talk about um, diets, actually, nutritional um, mistruths or truths, whatever you want to you wanna talk about. And so it, and I am recreationally and professionally interested in food intake and nutrition, shall we say. I love eating. <laughs> and so therefore, I've merged the two. I've got my day job in which I'm trying to teach, you know, the biochemistry of, of, of eating and metabolism. And actually, the more um, real world information about how we deal with diets, are there right diets? What is the, what's the kind of the best diet we can do? And that's, that's why I think um, I hopefully know a little bit of what I'm talking about. Okay, and it's perfect. And you already mentioned something. I've got a long list of questions and things here mm. from fans and from just, just me in general, who also has obvious interest in this being a professional footballer. Uh, the universal diet, a, a, a human universal diet, does it exist? Is there one? Uh, have we gone wrong in the search for it? Um, where do yeah, we so, stand? So there is no universal diet for, for the human being because there is no one human being. I think <laughs> without wanting to denigrate the entire human species, I think humans are like cockroaches in very many ways. And we are the ultimate adapter. And I think that has actually been our strength. It's why we've been around for better or for worse. And we are designed, people say we're designed to eat meat. We're designed not to eat meat, you know, and there's loads of things we're designed not or not to eat. Actually, we're designed to be adaptable and we can eat many things. Um, we're not designed to eat a single thing. We're designed to eat many things depending on what is around us, evolutionarily speaking. Okay. So no, there is no universal diet because we've been adapted um, to, in effect, eat what is around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. It's really hard though, as a modern human to understand what with marketing, the advertising, and like we talked about the misinformation, it's almost impossible to know who to believe, right? Um, when you're just an average consumer out there. What I found, and I've lived in Europe for you know over a decade for the most, most part, and obviously returning back home to the US, I see two different worlds of eating. And obviously, my, I'm wearing a Nigerian national team jersey. My, my family is also from, from Nigeria. And these continents share very different relationships to food and uh, the way you know, food is, is treated, harnessed, um, and so with, with, with that in mind, I kind of wanted to get into, if you could, and we're already at the point where I'm making you, <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing you to your extremes for the, for the clickbait in a sense, but mm -hmm. is there a food, if you had to avoid one food, one group of foods, what would it be? And also, if you could only eat one food, Ooh. what would that be? Oh my God. Um, I, I don't think I can answer that question. Would I avoid? No, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I would say that that's actually an impossible question to answer. And so, so okay. people who will stand up and actually answer the question, answer that question and give you an answer are pretty much lying. I think it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to okay. be the answer. I think there are going to be foods we have to eat less of, I think for sure. Okay. Nice. And there are foods that you can eat a lot of. 
And so, for example, foods that we eat less of, clearly we eat too much sugar today. That is that is, of course, true. Clearly, we eat too much like ultra processed foods and things like that. I think that's probably true. But should we remove it from our diets entirely? Well, I, I don't know. We can certainly eat a hell of a lot of vegetables. OK, and I think that that's the one thing that I could eat a ton of. But can we survive only on vegetables without anything else? Nah, you know, once again, we have to debate that. So that will be my answer. I, I think there are going to be a bunch of foods that we can eat a hell of a lot less of. Sugar is probably one of them. Um, and I think there are a lot of foods that we can eat a ton of. And that, largely speaking, is vegetables. Okay. Um, but I don't think there is one food I would eat only. And I don't think there is one food I would cut out completely. I saw you do. I saw you discussing the difference between processed and ultra processed foods. Could you kind of mm -hmm. get into that? Yeah. So uh, I, I think people, you know processed foods have a bad rap, right? So people, but actually, that's not true. Okay. So processed foods, cooking is a process. Fermentation is a process, right? Brewing is a process. Pickling is a process. Um, in fact, every almost every single food we eat aside from maybe walking down the street and plucking an apple off a tree, has been processed in some way. So processed foods are not bad for you. They've kept us alive. Now, ultra-processed foods, now this is the difference. Ultra-processed foods are um, a modern, um, a modern industrialized processes, shall we say, that we cannot replicate within a domestic kitchen. So in other words, this is an important, we can't do ultra process in our house because we don't have the, we don't have the equipment. We don't have the chemicals. We, we don't have the things to actually, to, to, to actually do it. And so ultra process is just a very different um, um, class of food. Now, I think there is an issue that I have. Now, ultra processed foods have been linked to a whole bunch of different diseases and people actually, and it's doing the rounds at the moment. We're talking about ultra processed foods. My issue with ultra processed is that it's too broad it's too blunt a, a um, category because it ranges anywhere from foods that I think are not controversial. You know, if you go out and eat like frozen nuggety things or frozen pizzas or, or you know, the way I think, okay, those are definitely ultra processed. But this, but they also include natural yogurt with some jam in it because the jam is ultra processed. The moment you put it into natural yogurt, which is not ultra processed, suddenly the whole dish becomes ultra processed. Or if you put a little bit of emulsifiers into a bread, suddenly the whole bread becomes ultra processed. I think there are foods we got to eat less of. And I think those are probably not controversial. I just think that ultra processed is a, it's too blunt a category to use in today's environment. We need to be more precise in what we're talking about when we're talking about food. It's my, it's my view. What would be the quantities of the ultra processed foods? Like if you can name a few of those um, that specifically we should be a little bit careful with, right? I mean, you said jam, right? If I just, my, if my diet was nothing but strawberry ultra processed jam, am I going to be able to perform on the field? Or like, so, so now now yeah. it depends what you're doing. So here's, here, here's the question. So I've just come back from this crazy... Um, cycle ride. Okay. I it was like, it was like a midlife crisis ride. And I've just cycled from, I've cycled the length of Britain. So at 1100, <laughs> 1000 miles in the past two weeks, I've cycled now. Wow. So, so, so what, you know, as part of a tour now, when you're actually in the middle of an exercise, climbing a mountain on a bicycle or whatever, eat what, like you can eat pure sugar. It doesn't really matter because your muscles are like sponges at that point and they're absorbing everything and using it immediately. Okay. So at that point, and I had a, I actually did it with a real time. I'm not yeah. diabetic. Okay. I did it with right. a real time, a blood glucose monitor just to do a bit of science. Okay. And when I was cycling, whatever I was doing, actually acted and I ate a, an energy bar or I drank a hundred percent carb kind of thing. My blood glucose level did not move. It did not move because my muscles were absorbing everything and using it. Now, when I was sat on my backside <laughs> at the hotel at night, and then I ate something, whoop, suddenly you see it rise. And so I think the answer there is it depends what you are doing. Now, if you're clearly not exercising or not moving, well, then you need to consider what you're eating in a different way than if you are, you're saying performing, right? Now, if you are in the middle of a game, right, and it's halftime and, and you just need some quick fuel, you're not going to sit there and try and eating uh, uh, 
something too complex because you need the fuel now. You need it now. And so actually pure carbs are probably the answer. Now, as a recovery food, when you're, you know, when you're finished, well, that's a very different thing, right? Because then you're trying to recover for the next game, the next day or two days on. Then you consider you need more protein, you need more this, you need more that. So the answer is it depends what you're doing at the time when you're eating. Right. And that does make a whole lot of sense. And there's been this entire boom uh, within this supplement industry um, for performance athletes and stuff like this. And it's been clearly it's it's had an effect on the game. Guys are along with all of the new understanding about recovering. Mm -hmm. It's been, you know, huge. But uh, I'll go into supplements then. That's a whole industry that is linked to food and things as well. And like you said, it does matter what you're doing, right? I have, you know, we have sponsors from different supplement companies and things like this. And I would imagine for the general populace, unless they're being as active as a professional athlete, they're not, they obviously don't need all of these things per se. I would, I would imagine trying to replace electrolytes, et cetera, and, and stuff like this if they're not actually running daily. What are we, how do we stand here with the supplement industry? Because I know that there are people, everyone feels uh, you've got vitamins you got to take, you got this you got to take. There's always something, there's always a new supplement and thing that someone should add to your food. You can't get it all out of food, they say, or can you? You know, where do you stand or what have you found on that whole debate? Okay, once again, and, and you're going to be very bored with me saying it, it depends. <laughs> okay. um, I think for, for vitamins or vitamins, um, however you want to mm -hmm. pronounce it, that is, I, I, I did a um, deep dive into vitamins once for another, for another program, which, which, which I did. And the and ultimately, what we can, just vitamins, okay? Now, leaving aside all the other kind of supplements that we have, okay. that this is what we found. If you can't afford to buy these supplements, vitamins, and actually eat it, you probably need them. Whereas if you can afford to buy the supplements <laughs> and the vitamins, you probably don't need them. And so for the vast majority of us, actually, even if our diets are relatively poor, Okay, we get enough vitamins out of the food that we out that we eat. Okay, and this is almost entirely this is almost entirely uh, uh, true. Now there are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. If you're pregnant uh, or trying to get pregnant, then you need folic acid. You know, if you are vegan, then you want to make sure you have B12 and iodine, that kind of thing. So there are there are exceptions to the rule. But generally, Joe Jane Doe Joe Schmo wandering around probably does not need a vitamin supplement. Now, okay. the other things, however, does differ. So some people, well, should I have protein? Um, should I have uh, a fiber? You know, there, there are a number of things. Then it does depend. Um, then it does depend what you are, what you are doing with, with, with your life. But vitamins, I am pretty much against vitamin supplements unless you are malnourished. Malnourished. Wow. Okay. That's not the current, that's not what the current paradigm seems to market to the, the people. But, uh, you, you just touched on another thing that I wanted to find out about. Mm. Veganism, vegetarians, mm. uh, how, what, where, part of the vegan culture will call for that, whether that's related to the treatment of animals. Okay, we can maybe just leave that aside for one second just to just, just talk about health. The food Let's talk about health, the right. food aspect of it. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Where and what, are they better off in any sort of ways? Or are they better off just because they're avoiding those ultra-processed foods? Fine. So I think uh, we need to draw a distinction, and I'm not, uh, uh, and I know your listeners will probably know the distinction, but there is a huge distinction between being vegetarian and vegan. And I think for the vast majority of human history, I think we probably were largely vegetarian, o o only because it was pretty difficult to chase down an antelope. Okay, they they move quickly. You know what I mean. And so actually, most of our diet were going to be what we dug out of the ground, what we're gonna what we're gonna do the thing. Um, but milk and eggs are nutritionally dense, nutritionally complete. And so therefore, as a vegetarian, you can be poor, you can be what have you. The moment you had some eggs and some milk, you were nutritionally complete. So vegetarianism, uh, uh, anybody can perform at the highest level being a, vegeta uh, being a vegetarian. Now, veganism um, is, an, is, an interesting, is an interesting thing. I do think that veganism is a privileged choice. Now, whenever I say this, I get shoes thrown at me, right? Because people, I do think it's a privileged choice because you have to be, you have to know what you're doing. 
Okay. Now you can do it. You, you're privileged. I'm privileged. Lewis Hamilton, you, you, you know, who's famously a, a, a vegan in our, uh, he can right. do it. So you need to make sure you watch your nutrients. You need to make sure your protein is complete. You need to make sure you're supplementing um, um, co co correctly. But I think if you don't know what you're doing, okay, then there is the danger of actually not getting the right amount of iron, the right amount of calcium um, that, 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 that you're there. Whereas, and, and actually, if you are underprivileged, the bottom quintile of society, for example, working two minimum wage jobs in order to make sure you feed your kids, I think veganism is very difficult to do, to do correctly. So that will be my distinction between the two. Does being vegan make you a better athlete? I asked this question actually to a to another pro uh, uh, pro professional athlete, um, a Canadian international miler. Okay, now 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 retired, and I asked him. I says, "Look, I think you can perform very well um, as as being vegan. As you watch what you're doing, he doesn't think that you actually makes you a better athlete." And I think that is probably the 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 question in terms of health. I think vegetarianism and veganism are both both fine. You're avoiding a lot of red meat and processed meats, which is which is what is actually we should eat less of. I'm not going to say it's bad for you. We should eat less of, uh, but that would be my that would be my answer. Okay, then you just said we should maybe eat less of, let's say, obviously the processed and the meat. Uh, the all meat diet was a pretty big craze, uh, let's say two Still or three is. years ago. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't hear as much about it, but I know it's still, it's solidified. I feel like it's a part of our society now. There's a, a, a good group of people who believe, listen, I just eat meat. I don't eat anything else. I'm feeling better than I've ever felt before. Inflammation's down, all these things. What do you attribute to their success? And uh, because the, the million dollar question that I found from people when they talk about the, the meat diet is like, that it's going to catch up to them someday. Like that they might feel fine right now but that in the end there's we got all sorts of cancer coming and blood things and what do you what do you think uh, look i don't understand now i don't clearly don't know when someone says i am carnivore um i don't know what they actually eat i cannot believe they don't require fiber i just from a from first principles from, from a biologist who so studies food intake um I cannot imagine. We're not lions. We're just not lions. We need our fiber. We need our vitamin, our vitamin C from somewhere else. And so I am just not convinced that carnivores are actually being carnivore. I bet you they're supplementing something. They're probably doing uh -huh. something. And if you're not, at some point, it will catch up with you. I think either you're going to keel over from a coronary, from a, some kind of heart problem, or you, you're going to end up getting increasing so much of your risk of bowel cancer for some people that I think... I, I, that is what the one diet I would not recommend. I think I do think we need to eat less meat as a as as, as a species. Not no meat, but I do think we need to eat less meat as a species. Sure, I mean, but there's a, a stark distinction you would make between red meat and say chicken. Uh, yes, there is. So there is a um, so I I if you want to looking just at the data, okay. If you want to rank the meats, shall we say, then the worst. I'm, I'm, I'm doing air quotes here. The worst for you is going to be processed meats. Okay. And I think we, bacon, sausages, you know, I think yeah, we do need to eat. Stuff like that. Exactly. Exactly. We don't eat that every day. We typically don't eat that every day and we shouldn't. It's, it's, it's the answer. Look, I love sausages. I love bacon, but I don't eat it every day. Then it comes red meat. Okay. Which is below the processed, the processed meats. We probably need to eat a little bit less of that. Now, chicken this may change, but the, all the data points to it pr probably being neutral, okay? Meaning that it doesn't, as long as you're not eating only chicken, okay, then mm. it's a neutral, and, and we're talking lean, lean chicken rather than necessarily with all the fat, then that is probably a neutral meat. It's not, uh, uh, it's healthy for you in a, in, in a diet. Fish is probably actively good for you. Okay, because of the type of the uh, uh, polyunsaturated fats that's actually that's actually in there, fish is probably uh, actively good for you, and that that's probably the ranking that I would do: processed meats, red meat, white poultry, white meat, and then fish. Okay, okay, that makes a whole lot of sense actually. And I've been trying to get into fish. I know it's good for me. I just can't do it with the taste, guys. I can't do it. I want to eat fish and i'll try it every once in a while but then i just can't do it and so i have a friend a family friend who mentioned to me that i should eat shark because it tastes a little that some shark is prepared and it kind of tastes like a little chicken i don't know if you've ever had shark before i have i have it's very meaty okay so i would like that you think 
I think probably in terms of, I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Because I do have people who don't like the fishiness of fish. And I understand that. Whereas shark and tuna are probably the two fish that if you actually cook like a steak and actually eat it, dude, you're not going to taste any fishiness because it is actually okay. very, very, um, very, very meaty. Um, whereas yeah. other, other fish, I can see where you're coming from in terms of the in terms of the fish oils. You don't have to eat fish, to be fair. You either can actually have like the those fish oil things, or if you eat a lot of olive oil, if you then then that's probably going to be it's going to be going to fine too. Olive oil is the other thing which is actively good for you, in, 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 in incidentally. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I do get a lot of olive oil. I do cook. Um, uh, I've I've got a question that I'm still saving, but I want to get into. We keep pulling up things oils that's another thing mm -hmm. everyone these uh, you got palm oil that they say to avoid the sunflower oil this only cook in olive oil but don't not when it's too high heat you should use coconut oil when it's high heat don't cook butter that's like all right guys like i'm just how do we how do we navigate this okay so once again I i'm only going from the data okay i am not making ju ju judging anybody i think olive oil is definitely actively good for you um but it does have a very very uh low burn heat. So in other words, I wouldn't stir fry with olive oil, not because it destroys the olive oil, but I think it impairs the flavor of the of, of the food. Okay. Olive oil have raw, that's good for you. I think what I would use for cooking is probably peanut oil or groundnut oil. Now, assuming you're not allergic. Okay. Now, please, people, okay. if you're allergic, because that also has, once again, is probably not as actively good for you as olive oil, but actually is good for you. So there's data out there which shows that peanuts um, um, and nut oil is actually is actually good for you, um, good for you as well. And that has a very, very high heat. Coconut oil is a very odd thing. It does have a very high heat, but coconuts are one of the rare vegetable oils, vegetable fats that are saturated. That, um, you know, and so the data, I think, is still out there. Evidence is still out there about whether or not it's good for you, bad for you, neutral. It is different from you than animal fat. It's true. And so I would say that this olive oil for salads and, and low heat cooking, okay, and then probably something like groundnut oils, as, as long as you're not allergic, I think for, for high temperature cooking. Those are the oils that I would that that I would actually that I would actually cook. Then then there are the whole vegetable oils that are that, that are out there. And I'm probably not well placed to understand the data. I don't think it's bad for you. We don't drink rapeseed oil, for example, or the sunflower oil as, as as much as much as we as much as we can. But I can tell you that actively that groundnut oil and olive oil are actively good for you. Now it doesn't mean that you don't have the calories. It doesn't mean that if you have too much of it, you still won't gain weight. I'm talking about health for your heart, that that kind of that kind of thing. Uh, okay, and you hit you hit the word uh, on the head. Explain to me this issue with calories. Obviously, calorie counting was a thing, but I saw also a highlight of you explaining what happens to your food and that some things change possibly when cooking or eating raw food and the amount of caloric intake that we have. What's going on there? So, well, first of all, let's. What is a calorie? I, I'm. Some of you will know, but let's just let's just define it. So, a calorie is the um, a food calorie. Okay, is the amount of heat it takes to raise the temperature of one liter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. That is the definition of a calorie. So, when I say that, then people go, "Well, then they're all equal, right?" Because I've just described, I've just given you, I've just given you a definition, and that's true. If the calorie is inside you as a little poof of energy, okay, then yes, they are all equal. The problem is obviously we do not eat calories. We eat food. We eat food and then our body then extracts the calories. So let me give you just, 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 just a couple of examples. So if you ate 100 calories of just pure sugar, okay, the white powdered stuff, I think you pretty much get all the calories out, maybe 98% of the calories because it's sugar, sucrose, table sugar is one molecule of glucose, one molecule of fructose. You cut it in half, we absorb it. That's it. Now, so that's one extreme. Now let's take another extreme, um, sweet corn or corn on the cob. Okay? Now, when you have 100 calories of corn on the cob, okay, and then you sort of look in the porcelain uh, um, um, the, the next day, it's clear you haven't absorbed anywhere close to all of the sweet right. corn because you can see it. But if you take sweet corn, you desiccate, you dry it, you pound it into a cornmeal, you make cornbread, corn tortilla, whatever you're going to do with it, suddenly you have absorbed far more of the corn. Whereas if you go to the supermarket and look, it's, it says 100 calories of tortilla or 100 calories of sweet corn, whereas it's exactly the same source of food. So that is my point, right? Where 
we have to actually extract the calories from the food and how you process, how you cook it, how you actually do different things to the food does matter. That is why it makes a difference whether or not you're eating a donut, you're eating a steak, or you're eating a carrot. It does make a difference. Once you've absorbed and actually pull out the calories, well, then it's a very different scenario because then we use the calories equally. But get our body getting to the calories, it really, really matters what we're eating. So then, in a sense, there must be, and I've never done a search for this, like the ultra absorbing other than sugar, are there just like, is there, are there a few foods that are just super ultra absorbing? My body takes in all of it. And so therefore I can run forever. So I think it's, I think it's probably the, the, the other way around. So what are the elements of food that prevent, that, that make your body work harder to extract the calories? I think it's probably the, the, the better way of doing that. And the two items which make our body work harder are protein content and fiber. Now, fiber, largely we can't absorb. There's obviously, there's obviously uh, digestible fiber, soluble fibers that we can have, but largely comes out the other side. Okay, that's the sweet corn mm -hmm. effect. Um, so the amount of fiber in a food, the difference, this is the difference between eating an orange versus drinking OJ, okay? Where if you drink OJ, orange juice, there is no fiber, and so or very little, and so therefore we are, our body absorbs the sugar very, very quickly. Whereas when we eat exactly the same food, which is the orange, sugar levels take a longer time to get released because, because your body has to work through the fiber. So fiber. Now, protein is interesting. Of the macros, okay, so fats, uh, uh, carbs, and protein, um, protein takes the longest and is chemically the most complex to take apart, to metabolize. So much so that when we actually eat 100 calories of protein, our body is only ever able to absorb 70 calories, 7-0. So 30% of protein calories that we eat everywhere, okay, we release as heat. It just takes... It takes dough to make dough, right? It takes it, it. Our body needs to kind of work through the protein, digest it, metabolize it, and do all the things. And so, protein calories, for example, just as an example, are thirty percent wrong everywhere. The, the the back of the pack does not does not reflect the actual protein content. And so, the percentage of protein and percentage of fiber in a food really, really marks out the caloric availability of a food. So in other words, how hard your 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 body has to work in an individual food. So I look at it from that direction. Shouldn't we have regulation? And shouldn't this be, this sort of knowledge is, <laughs> I mean, it's priceless. Like if, if you're really trying to get a good grasp of what it is that you're trying, how come we don't do this? What's what, why, Where's the disconnect? It feels like there's a disconnect here in the food industry in the same way that there's a disconnect between the prevention of disease you know, and uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, let's say. like you, you, you know, I completely agree with you. So look, I, just to point out, right, I didn't make the discovery uh, that, sure, that sure. of this. I, I'm just looking at the information, okay? This is just for people think I'm some... Um, and I have been talking to, to the food industry. The number of people that don't know this is amazing. It, it is really, really amazing. And I don't understand why. Um, um, the, either, <laughs> incidentally, what I'm not trying to argue is to have better calorie counting. That's not what I'm talking about. But I think that we need to highlight, uh, you know, I, certainly in Europe, okay, I don't know what they do in the United States. Uh, but in Europe, we sort of have this traffic light system, right? In the front of the pack, it highlights how much sugar, how many calories. I think it needs to highlight different things. I think it needs to highlight how much protein there is in a food and how much fiber there is in a food. Sugar, yes, but how much protein and fiber because it then gives you an idea. It's almost shorthand for the quality of the food. Going back to the ultra-processed foods, when we, which, we, which we talked about earlier, the reason why they are not great for you it's because the ultra processing processing removes protein and removes fiber, depending. Fiber only comes from vegetables. So, so uh, And so therefore, the 400 calorie ready meal that you're eating, okay, with lower protein and lower fiber is very available, which means that the 400 calories, we are more likely to absorb a far higher percentage of the 400 calories, as opposed to if we ate a steak or if we cooked, you know, had just cauliflower that we steamed, whatever it is, what, normal cooking. Okay, um, we're not ultra processing it. So in other words, our body has to work harder to actually get the calories out. So 400 calories of a steak versus 400 calories of exactly the same steak that's been cooked for six hours is very different in terms of the amount of calories we actually absorb from it. Okay. Yeah, it seems 
it's stuff that we would, I would imagine most people would want to understand, right? Because I think when you say that, I mean, we do have stuff on, on, on the food in the US and obviously it's been quite a journey. And even in my life, I've seen obviously changes of things. We've got the food pyramid that, you know, was, was this way. It was like, eat this and, and then they just flipped it upside down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, and so obviously I'm watching things, things change. And um, I would say that the American consumer in general is a being confused, let's say by calories. And like you said, I'm also not for calorie counting. It just seems to make some, it's so confusing just in general. And then not to know what you've just explained. I don't think the average consumer is truly aware of that, right? Maybe three out of 10, four out of 10, maybe, right? It's but not, it's not, even, I found, it's, it's not even the average consumer. I've spoken to people who make food. We're talking like chefs or, or, or people who work within the food industry. They don't know it. Now, if the right. people who actually are creating our foods, either in a restaurant or, or actually making the packaged foods, if they don't know it, how is the average consumer going to know it? That's, 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 that will be my point. And that's what leads me to this other issue that I think in America that I found strange uh, that I don't necessarily see as much outside in all my world travels. You know, um, We put all natural on things and natural they'll put natural flavorings and they'll put natural and when you look at the ingredients it's not it's a bunch of stuff that i can't pronounce uh a lot of times but on the front we're allowed to say things like all natural you know and then it says gluten-free which is another thing i need to, to to ask you about but like that labeling of all natural gives in my opinion a lot of american consumers some safety they feel safe looking down the aisle thinking, I need to be eating more healthy. And they'll go to this and they'll see natural and that's, that's it. They won't look at sugar. They won't look at the salt, sodium, whatever, any, anything else. They'll just see the, this is natural. And I, all the time I'm having conversations with my friends and, I'll, and they'll say, yeah, I've been changing it up and eating and, and I'm asking. And it, it does turn out to be these ultra processed foods and they're not getting enough vegetables and they're not you know, eating all this stuff. But they feel that they've changed something because they're not eating McDonald's or pizza. Right? They've switched to something else. And that's where I see this huge issue. I don't know if you've, if you've noticed this. I don't know how in the UK if it's like that. but It, it, it is like that in the UK. So, so I think this is the issue, right? There are going to be foods which are McDonald's. You call it McDonald's. Other, other fast food restaurants exist or Coca-Cola. Look, sure. there's nothing wrong with them. They, 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 as a treat, we go. But no one ever walks into McDonald's and thinking, I am having a healthy meal. I am having whatever. You go in there for whatever reasons you go into. And so in very many ways, that is fine because I know what I'm going into. I know what I'm expecting. And there is a big difference between I'm having vegetables and, and some grilled chicken. Okay. So those are the two extremes. It's the stuff in the middle, okay, which is in which has this halo of health where in effect, they're trying to sell themselves as healthy, but I know better than McDonald's. And that is where the real toxicity is because then people are trying to eat better. We want to eat better. We want better for our kids. We want better for ourselves, right? Most people do. And so I think we do need to almost regulate better um, um, or at least give better information so people wanting to make a healthier choice can make the healthier choice rather than being I don't want to say fooled. I don't want to get sued. But the verbal gymnastics that, 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 that is used, okay, on it, all natural. All natural means nothing, right? Because sugar is all natural and so is salt. Whereas there are some chemicals that are perfectly fine for you, right? It depends what we're talking about, obviously. But some chemicals are perfectly fine for you. So just because it's all natural, cyanide is all natural. That's not good for you. And so I think it's one of these things where all, we need to use more precise language when you say the amount of protein and the amount of fiber, that is a number. That I'm not making stuff up. That is a number. Now, we don't need to get, do it in grams because no one understands what that means. But I think we probably should traffic light it. We should, probably should say green is higher in protein. Yellow is middle. Red is not so much. Okay, something like that. But I do believe that ridiculous statements like all natural um, have no place in our food because they don't give us proper information. Right. Right. And yeah, I think verbal gymnastics is the best way to do it because there is, like you said, not trying to get sued. They're not lying no, correct. about what they're saying, <laughs> but that's not the intention. Like my friends are going in there with the intention of improving their diets and they're not necessarily getting that. And that's where the disconnect that's is That's where the disconnect is. And that's and that's, what, yeah. Right. Um, 
Also, everyone is gluten intolerant now. What's happening? So, okay, <laughs> leaving aside the, I think, roughly speaking, 1% of the human species and, and whatever race and ethnicity you are, are celiacs. And celiac are allergic to gluten. And you got to stay away from this stuff. Like, seriously, don't, don't get anywhere close to it. Okay, so that's 1% of the human species. Probably, actually... Three to four percent of the species of the human species. Now, this is slightly more difficult to measure. Are genuinely gluten intolerant. So this could be being a little bit farty after food, or actually like having a tummy ache. Okay, and you probably should stay away from from gluten as well. The issue is not those three to four percent of human beings. The issue is that we certainly in Europe and in and in North America spend, you know, up to twenty to twenty five percent of us will go out and buy gluten free just as a matter of because we think it's better for us. So much so, it's become marketable. They've taken foods that never have had gluten. I'm ethnically Chinese, as we've, as we've discussed. Gluten-free rice. Rice doesn't have gluten. It never had gluten. It never will have gluten. Gluten-free water. Gluten-free shampoo. I'm, I'm not that I'm an expert. Yeah, no. But <laughs> if you Google gluten-free shampoo, oh my God, millions of hits. So I think there is a, there is once again a disconnect. Now, now, then you might ask, well, how did this happen to be? Okay, what, why gluten free? And so it comes down to the kernel of truth. And the, the thing about gluten free is, when you have gluten free, you're removing gluten grains. Okay, which tends to be wheat and oats and barley. But actually, not all grains have gluten. Like rice doesn't have gluten. But general, most of your general consumer does not know this. They think, oh my God, it's a, it's comes from, it's comes from a grass. So therefore, it's gluten. And so therefore, I got to avoid it. And so actually, most people who are gluten free avoid all grains. They end up eating a little bit of potatoes, but all grains. So it's actually a pretty low carb diet, actually. And you got to replace the carbs with some, uh, the, the calories with something else, the energy with something else. And so most gluten free diets are relatively high in protein. And so when you actually, Atkins, keto, that kind of thing. And if you have more protein, a calorie of protein, which we talked about is only 0.7 of a calorie, but a calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb in that order. So protein makes you feel fuller. So these gluten-free diets tend to be higher in protein. You eat more protein, you feel fuller. You feel fuller, you eat less, you lose weight. And so it is a way of eating less calories, but it has nothing to do with the gluten. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I want to go back. Uh, that way I don't miss this mm. because we did a, we had an interesting conversation and a podcast with, um, once again, one of these really large football supplement companies. They do some of their own research. Um, and also obviously they take and share just like, you know, all, all companies are doing, um, with some fairly famous, famous football clubs that they're, they're providing this information to. And the reason I'm doing this long drawn out introduction into into who they are is because they came up with some really interesting conclusions of which I would love I haven't had the chance to get any anyone's true opinion on at least you know someone with your stature they essentially concluded that to some degree vegetables are bad um, and the process and the thought process behind that was that and obviously I'm not I'm gonna butcher this but I can give you the the general idea Everything that is growing above ground essentially has something within it that is trying to, let's say, keep you from eating it, right? Some sort of uh, anti, uh, I don't want to call it poison, but, uh, you know, it would release something. I'm not sure if you've heard this, this sort of theory, you know, things above ground, vegetables above ground, plants, these, they will, they'll release something, you know, to keep you, I don't, don't eat me. I'm, you know, uh, I'm a living being or thing like this. Root vegetables, on the other hand, because they grew underground, they were they're like we're okay with this. That ginger, sweet potato, I think uh, all of those things that's okay. But the vegetables above crown, they were essentially saying fruits okay, um, white rice okay, um, pasta bad, and um, yeah. So I don't know if you've ever heard anything like that. I have not heard anything like that before, but it sounds like the biggest load of. D do I've ever heard. So, so a couple, a couple of examples. So, so fruits, the, the reason why fruits are okay, that, that would be the one, uh, uh, because that would have been the first example I, I actually brought up, is they're designed to be eaten so that you can then poo out the seeds, 
Okay. So foods mm-hmm. are designed to be eaten. They're designed to be delicious. Please eat me. Um, so that we can then sprinkle the seeds, the, 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 the seeds around. So that, that's, that's, that's a, a classic example. A lot of vegetables are designed to be eaten. You know, so just as an example, we don't eat grass. No, no, we do eat actually the, the, the grains of stuff, but grasses are designed to be eaten. Okay, to grow. Because you mow the lawn, they keep growing. You mow the lawn, they keep growing. Okay. And actually, it actually enhances and encourages them, encourages them to grow. Now, in terms of vegetables having some sentient effect of not wanting to be of not wanting to be eaten, I think first of all, they come up and they go down. They come up and they go down. There is no in a, on an annual cycle. There is no good reason to say that therefore they're trying to poison you. It depends on who you are, depends on what you are. Some vegetables are poison, are poisonous to some animals and are not to others. Um, potatoes, for example, okay, I know they're underground, but if you try to eat a potato raw or a green potato, it's poisonous for you, okay? Whereas if you cook it, it's not. So there are going to be vegetables actually that are poisonous for you if you eat it raw. Rhubarb is a classic example of that. Don't eat it raw. Um, whereas if you cook it, it suddenly becomes good for you. So no, it is, I think they're trying to tie some complex backstory, complex backstory to, I don't know, some pseudoscientific, I don't know what they're trying, that they're trying to say. There is absolutely no truth in that. There are going to be some po- uh, uh, plants that are poisonous for you. Some are not, some that need to be cooked, mm-hmm. some that don't. But that, right. what you just said is nonsense. Not you. What, 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 <laughs> not you. Yeah, you yeah. haven't said it was nonsense. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I get it. And I'm trying to convey. And, and it, here's another thing that they found to be, and this is one of the new fads. And I'm not sure if you know about this because obviously you're in the UK, but uh, there's a famous player right now named Holland. Uh, uh, he's a Norwegian player. He's become, his diet has kind of become quite interesting and, and famous. He wasn't the one that started it, but he kind of caught on to it. And because he's probably the best striker in the world, let's say for the most part right now, who, he plays Oliver. for Man City, right? This is the guy who plays for Man City. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. The, and uh, raw liver, raw heart um, in the morning, um, first thing. And so when I did this podcast, for instance, I actually, I tried it. They, 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 they called somebody. They brought, they brought liver over, cow liver. And you don't even chew it is what he would do. He would just be a take it, swallow it, and, uh, you know, feel the... The great effects. Uh, I, I felt that the what they explained essentially is that it's just so nutrient nutrient dense um, that we're getting such great benefit from it. And eating it raw obviously is the best way to do that because cooking it would then maybe mess with that sort of composition. So I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I don't know if it has any wings, but this is what he's doing a whole lot of. So that that has a sort of a almost a paleo argument to it because when we um so one of the things that that hunter gatherers would do is when you kill whatever animal you've killed okay that you would actually eat the liver just right out of the animal okay and you're right it is incredibly nutrient dense it is and actually eating raw liver as long as it's sort of somewhere close to when it came out of the animal i don't think there's anything necessarily bad for you as long as there are no parasites in it now the thing about <laughs> So the thing about it, it is nutri- nutritionally dense, but the cooking of it, okay, doesn't destroy that many kind of nutrients. There are some nutrients that are destroyed by cooking. Vitamin vitamin C is a classic example, okay, which is why vegetables should largely be, fruit should largely be eaten raw. But the iron that's w- within the liver, all of the, you know, the nutrients, the protein and everything, the fat that is actually in there are not going to be destroyed by the cooking. And cooking exists because it kills the parasites, and so therefore it has a, ch- a greater chance to keep us alive. So I would say that there is nothing wrong with eating good, okay, that you know the provenance of the liver. There's nothing wrong with it. There's just there's nothing I can say, aside from the fact okay. that there is a risk of having, uh, uh, if you're eating some dodgy animal with some parasites, then that's bad for you. So, but I don't think there is anything special about necessarily about eating it raw. It just has this caveman type 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 feel to it. That would be my that would be my interpretation right. of it. What about hearts? Raw cow heart, raw other. I'm pretty sure. I, I don't understand why you have too. to have it raw because if you cook a heart, uh, mm-hmm. um, some people find it chewy. I don't mind hearts. I like chicken hearts, for example. Okay, barbecue. Love chicken hearts. Um, I don't. Yeah. It, it is very low in fat. 
because it's very high in protein, because the heart is not necessarily coated in fat. It shouldn't be coated in fat. So actually, as a lean source of protein, it's very good for you. I've got nothing, you know, not, nothing against that. I, I don't understand the rawness of it. I mean, the only thing which actually com co comes from is the fact that cooking it does increase the amount of calories you actually get from it because cooking is an extension of your digestion, right? Sort of, if you're breaking down something in the fire before, the advantage obviously is, you, as, as I said, you kill parasites. But the other thing it does is it, is it actually increases the calorie availability. In fact, one of the things which has allowed our big brain, human brain, is through the control of fire. Because one of the things, obviously, it kept us warm. Obviously, we could use it as a defensive tool and it lit up the things. But it let us get more calories for the same amount of work. If you kill an antelope and ate it raw, you would get so many calories. If you cook it, you suddenly got more calories, which meant that you've already chased the antelope down. You may as well maximize the amount of calories you get from it. And so this control of fire allowed us to sit and think a bit more and our brains got bigger. We became modern humans. So once again, back to what are we designed to eat? We're designed to eat raw food. Uh-uh. We're designed to eat what's there. We're designed to maximize the amount of calories that are there and cooking helps us do this. So, I mean, it is, and this has been my, my take essentially that, yeah, your diet and everything, and basically I'm kind of getting that same sense from you, it's an adaptive thing. A, it depends on maybe obviously your, your, what you're intolerant to, your, your allergies or allergens and, and, and stuff, then what you're doing, how, how active you are, right? In your example for like the cyclist or me playing, playing football. Um, and then uh, I don't know how much study or you've looked into this, but the sedentary lifestyle that we pretty much have today where we sit for hours on end every day, right? Is that playing any sort of role within our food? Like, could we be, I, I don't know how to even phrase this question. Should, should we be really and truly eating less based on the fact that we're sedentary? We're not doing what we just talked about these ancestors chasing down antelope. That human and this guy who sits in the office for eight hours a day, five days a week, are, are they really the same? Do they have the same things, you know? So, I mean, a, a couple of couple of things. So people say that we eat more today than we used to. Uh, we don't actually. If we go back to the Victorian times, so we're not coal miners anymore or tin miners or, or, or working mm -hmm. whatever it is. We have dish, as you say, we have dishwashers, we drive cars, we have washing machines. We actually eat, on average, I think the number is like, at, at, during Victorian times, an average man or woman would probably be eating something along the lines of more than 3,000 calories a day. Why? because they'd be eating it and it'd be fat and it'd be thingy. It wouldn't be ultra processed because it didn't exist at the time because they were doing manual labor, everything from washing, from doing everything you're doing. So we, our numbers now have dropped because now famously we think two to 2,500 calories, depending on who you are, depending on what you're doing. So we as a species are actually eating less. However, we sat on our behinds as we've just discussed. Okay. And the food that we actually are eating is different. There, it's, there are more ultra-processed foods there. The, the, the food, the caloric availability is actually very, very different. So it's definitely the interaction of the two. We don't move enough anywhere close to being, uh, um, 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 moving enough. Um, and we need to really fix the food system that, that, that we're actually in. I think it's an interaction of, of both of them. So then if we're not eating more, what is causing the massive obesity problem in these first world countries? So we're not eating more in terms of pure calorie amounts. But once again, we don't eat calories, we eat food. The types of food that we get, so the types of food that we get access to are very, very different. So in the past, the, uh, the amount of calories we ate was tied to the amount of effort that actually was put in to, to, to getting the calorie, evolutionarily speaking, okay? The problem today is that calories are actually very cheap. Now, the quality of the calorie is another thing entirely. Like in the UK, okay, people have done the maths, the math. Um, you can get nearly a thousand calories for less than a pound. Now, how good are they? Mostly of these are going to be based on potato, like, like fries, okay? Like French fries, for example, are cheap, okay? Now that is, I don't mind a French fry, but clearly that's not a balanced diet. And so that is the problem. The problem is that calories have become increasingly cheaper, but we are now in a society 
that the cheapest that the cheapest foods are not generally speaking the healthiest foods. And people then always say that wait 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 you're lying, right? Lentils are cheap, beans are cheap. This is true. But how much energy does it take to cook a lentil or cook a bean, okay, particularly if you buy them dry, compared to a microwave meal which only takes 2 minutes of energy. 2 minutes of energy or whatever in a microwave compared to putting it on a stove for 2 hours. The cost needs to take that into account as well. And look, you and I, and maybe most of your listeners, are not food insecure people, right? In other words, we can probably think about our protein and our supplementation. But back to Mrs. Smith, two minimum wage jobs trying to feed her kids. Look, she's going to try and feed her kids with whatever she can get. Unfortunately for her, it tends to be the cheaper, far less healthier stuff that she's able to, to, able to afford. And I think it's an... It's a complex mixture of all of that stuff. We need to fix our food systems so that healthy foods are more equitably available across all of society rather than just the people who can afford it. Right. And that's the that's the number one thing that sticks out, especially too when I when I go home, you if you stop at some of these health food stores, I mean it's it's insane what you will spend money on trying to eat the <laughs> healthy food, that's right. right? And yeah. And Whereas so if you buy the unhealthy that, stuff, then you can actually get very, very cheap. Oh, you get whatever you whatever you need. I mean, and for nothing, you can walk away. It, it's insane. And I even there, I was just in just in London, um, and looking at this, I'm just tons, just packs of food you could walk away with that could keep you going and moving. But the quality of that food is clearly lower than than. It, and, and then uh, once again, also the, qu- the 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 quantity of food you would get at this natural food store. Also, they sell them in little tiny packs, and you know, and that makes it. I don't know. Sometimes we have this like little romantic idea about our our natural food. Like you know, if they sell in this little pack, oh, this little tiny thing, it's so good for me. And we kind of it's almost as if our society likes paying more for this. That, that we, we get a good feeling out of that, right? That that whole give and take of this cost me twenty dollars. Instead, I could just go buy a one dollar, you know, for a box of fries. But uh, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you because we're getting close to here uh, at the end. Fasting has become another really big thing um, within society. Is there uh, a way to go about fasting? Is it different? Because I've also seen different information. Is it the same for men and women too? Because I, I saw something about uh, women fasting versus men fasting, and that maybe there's some difference at play based on the hormones and et cetera. I don't know what you've... I'll deal with the studied. second half of the question first, the men versus women. Now I'll come back to fasting. So uh, yeah, there's right. going to be a big... So our men, look, we, we're, very, we're pretty uncomplex creatures. We're born, we think about food, we think about the other thing, that's all we think about, then we die. Now women are far more c- c- complex because of their hormonal changes, depending on what stage they are, not only within their life, within their month. And yes, you're absolutely right. Your, the, a woman's where she is in the cycle and so therefore hormonal will make a difference in terms of not only the effect of fasting or eating, even training. You know how we're now increasingly beginning to think, look, we got to think less male when we are when we are working with particularly with professional athletes and stuff. So undoubtedly, OK, a woman needs to there needs to be more research done on how cycles and how hormonal cycles actually work within the context of everything we've been talking about today. And sadly, very little has been done. Most of the research has been done um, in men, in white men, for, 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 for lack of a better term. So we, wow. need, we need better. Okay? Uh-huh. So the question about fasting is, does it give you any additional benefit beyond the calorie restriction, beyond the energy restriction? Um, and the issue is, because fasting is obviously good for reducing the amount of food you're eating. Even if it's time restricted, even if it's um, you know five two or whatever you like to follow, uh, animal studies tend to point to a subtle uh, benefit, but the problem is high quality human studies. It's it's really quite difficult to do high quality human um, um, feeding studies. Be- if if anything, it's because you can't randomize it. Okay, you you either fasting or you're not. You either eating vegetables or you're not. You can't pretend you're you're doing something else. Um. I don't think the evidence that is out there is overstated. Now, would I be surprised to actually see a subtle, uh, a positive effect on it? Uh, I wouldn't be, if only because actually 
we never had a constant supply of food, right? Even even when we had agriculture, there were times there were famine, the, the, the rain might wash away your crops, uh, the antelope ran away. And so we actually are designed for, for feast, famine, feast, famine. That is what we're designed to do rather than feast, feast. This is part of the problem, right, that we're having at the moment. So would I be surprised uh, uh, if there was a subtle metabolically uh, um, metabolic effect on fasting? I wouldn't be. But... It's overstated at the moment. It is overstated because the data is not there to say that this is the way this is the way to live. Okay, uh, isn't there this? Then where where are, where is everyone pulling that that one big stat about how amazing fasting for your cells, how it allows them to actually regenerate, to do all this stuff when you stop eating for a while, you, and then the testosterone maybe goes up and. All that. I mean, I'm surely you've seen some of that. I have. I feel like that's the big boost. So, so, so let's biolog- Let's do with it biologically. Okay. So, so um, look, you're an athlete, and so what happens is, what kind of fuels do we actually store in our body? In terms, okay. So we we don't store any protein. Now we have protein, but all the protein in our body is active. There is no inert store of protein in there. Okay. So we either use it or we store it. And it's going to be stored as fat. Now, we do store carbs as glycogen, but probably only around a day's worth. A couple of thousand, maybe 2,500 calories worth of carbs, sugar in our blood, only a little bit, and glycogen. The vast majority of stores is fat. So depending on how, look, I'm a little bit flobby, okay? So depending on how uh, uh, lean you are, you'd store anywhere from 60 to 180 thousand calories of fat as stores in your body. Why am I telling you any of this? Because what happens is when we actually burn, the first fuel we burn is going to be the carbohydrates, okay, glycogen, because it's the easiest, most accessible. It's very not dense, but it's the most accessible. And then it then begins, it doesn't go one, it's not binary, but the more, as your carb levels begin to drop, your, your, your fat burning goes up. So the biology of the system is if you fast, so in other words, if you say do 5-2, you are burning through your, glyco- your glycogen stores, and so you end, up burning more, uh, you end up burning more fat, just naturally. So that's where the whole fasting thing has, has, has actually come from. There's also a production of ketones and that, and, and et cetera, et cetera, and that has some beneficial effects as well. So that is the truth of, 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 of the matter and where the fasting has actually, has actually come from. It has very little to do with resting your cells or resting thingies or what have you, but actually trying to get your body to actually burn more fat. That is why people, that's not why people fast because they're imagining things elsewhere, but that is what happens to your body when you do just a, a, a brief fast. You, you go through your glycogen stores and you begin to burn more fat. Okay. Okay. Um, Last two questions, if you have time. Do you have time? Yes. Uh, this last one is, once again, we talked a little bit about supplements. Have you ever heard of ashwagandha? No. You've never heard of ashwagandha? No. Okay, that's really so ne- But every day is a school day, of- so tell me. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I believe this has the name, the Indian ginseng. I believe that's where it, it, it's kind of got its, its idea from. It's a root, once again. Uh, you know, and it has all these, all the great claimed benefits that any other root or herb would have. It belongs to a group of um, herbs called adaptogens, which I'm sure you're uh, aware of. Uh, I don't know what the research shows entirely, and I can only, this is all anecdotal based on my uh, career, but there's two sections, basically. There's the um, natural pre-workout energy boosting things that are with uh, adaptogens and all of that stuff. And then there's the, you know, the, the sector with, with caffeine loaded with different stuff. And maybe not, I'm not saying that it's bad for you, but it's more chemically induced, it seems. Um, and those two schools are kind of the two fighting with the adaptogens now getting more love in, in the world. So I was just curious if you knew anything about adaptogens and their role within food and performance and just general well-being because mushrooms is cordyceps, reishi, uh, Siberian ginseng, all of these things play this massive role within the adaptogen world. And I didn't know if that was something that could be say, so, said to be better. So I, I, 
these are what we call then nat- like almost like um, traditional remedies or, or whatever you want to call it versus the stuff that's actually been been uh, constructed. Okay, so, so so the modern stuff. And I think there is no one that's better than the other. You either have something that works or something that doesn't work. That's the first thing. Okay, and this can involve ginseng or or something of a powder in a pill. The trick is obviously when you are having something like a root or or or, or, an, or an herb is that they are more complex. Because they don't only come with one ingredient in it. And if it works, and if we know that this works, then someone will probably be smart enough to at some point extract what the active ingredient or ingredients are. And then you have a general then you have a general idea. Sometimes you do need the interaction. So number sometimes it will never work because sometimes you do need the whole food, okay, in order for you to actually have that effect. So in my view, so I don't know enough about it to say whether or not it, uh, it does or does not work, right? But if it does work because someone has done the study, then actually, uh, I have no problems with, 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 you know, aspirin. Where did it come from? It came from the bark of a tree, right? So someone was sucking on a, a on some bark uh, because it removed their pain until someone extracted aspirin from it, and that's how it works. And this is going to be the true for many natural remedies out there that that work perfectly fine, okay? But people are still trying to find out what the active ingredients are. So no, I am... Uh, natural or modern or traditional, there are the uh-huh. stuff that works or stuff that doesn't work. I see. Okay. Uh, and the last thing, you probably remember the show, The Jetsons. Yep. You remember that show, yep. this cartoon, you're right? You remember their projections of the future, right? Which they got wrong on us flying around and all the way we were this. But they also had this thing, if you remember, this little pill of food that you could eat that would take care of you and sustain you for a large period of time. Are we ever going to get to a future where we can just pop a pill and be done with our food intake? Is there is there any truth to this whatsoever? I mean, if you can give a glimmer of hope or are you going to shut it down completely that we're going to get to there? Look, I think it definitely is certainly as possible. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible today, but I, th- I think it certainly will be possible where we actually end up just having a pure supplement that we ate that would be nutritionally complete. They already kind of exist, okay? The Huels yeah. of the world, or if you're a if you're a astronaut or something like that, they already exist. Now, how good are they for you over a lifetime? The studies have not been done, and how much joy do you actually get from it? So I think that probably is two things. Is it possible? I think it probably is. Okay, I don't think it's beyond the wit of humankind to 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 come up with something like this. But given that actually, foods have huge cultural resonance they do of course they do right uh, what kind of carbs do you eat i like rice but that's because of my ethnicity my wife who's english she likes her, her her carbs as bread now those are culturally embedded things and there is different joys uh, uh, from it so i think the scientific answer is yes i do think it's possible um that we can extract all of the necessary nutrients and micronutrients that we need and put it into a pill and eat it and survive it sort of already exists but i think it would irreparably remove some of the joy of life. And I think that is sad if that really happened. Yeah, totally. Uh, Giles, this has been amazing. Obviously, I could talk to you forever and ever and ever. My questions will go on. There's probably a book full of, <laughs> and I keep adding to it. So we'll have to do this again. I really appreciate it. Uh, is there anywhere that you want to send people to check out more? Obviously, they're going to be very interested to hear more from you. I mean, look, I, 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 I got a I got a couple of books. I've got something called Gene Eating, which was my first book, and then Why Calories Don't Count, available everywhere. Um, and if you, you just go, I a terrible thing to say. If you Google me, um, follow me on Instagram. Um, you'll be able to find some of my videos for for more for more information. Okay. Yeah, we'll link to everything obviously in the notes, and if you're watching this, it's in the description box. But uh, Giles, thanks for being here and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for having me.